Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending this session on insect management. Um, our speaker here today is Dr. Robert or Bob Cook. He works for the University of Minnesota Extension as an associate professor and extension entomologist. He is a native of Monticello, Minnesota, and his primary responsibilities for his job is integrated pest management and applied ecology of soybean insects and mites. Um, and so Dr. Cook decided to record his presentation because he was worried about uh, internet connectivity. So we'll play his um, presentation for you, but he will be here for the Q&A session and would be very glad to answer your questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, play his presentation for you now. Hello, my name is Bob Cook and I'm an extension entomologist at the University of Minnesota. My responsibilities here uh, include the integrated pest management and applied ecology for insect and mite pests in soybean. Today, I'm going to talk to you about insect management in soybean. And um, typically, I focus just on soybean aphids because that's our main pest these days. However, today, I'm going to broaden the scope and talk about some of the other pests that we've been dealing with um, in various parts of the state over the years. So first off, we will talk a little bit about soybean aphid. And you can see these uh, yellowish green little sap suckers covering a, a soybean leaf here in this picture. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this pest. Um, the main thing I wanted to highlight is that we are still dealing with soybean aphid populations that have resistance to the pyrethroid insecticides. The pyrethroids are one of the main groups of insecticides that we've been relying on for almost two decades now for management of this pest. So it's not a huge surprise that with so much use of this group of insecticides that we're starting to see resistance. We first documented this resistance in 2015, and we've been seeing it every year since. So from 2015 to 2020, every year in Minnesota, we've documented um, some populations at least of the soybean aphid that have resistance to pyrethroid insecticides. And not only in Minnesota, we've made um, documentations of pyrethroid resistance in soybean aphids in North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and to the north of us in Manitoba. Um, this has included field level failures where we've received reports from growers, consultants, and others um, about applications of pyrethroid insecticides uh, failing to provide the expected level of control against this pest. Um, we developed a, a laboratory bioassay where we used the glass vials pictured in the corner of this slide here to quantify how resistant or how susceptible this pest is to the insecticides and we can compare that to um, a laboratory population. And we've done that for multiple years. Um, and more recently, our research has advanced to the point where we're looking at the mechanisms of resistance or actually trying to determine how these aphids are surviving the pyrethroid insecticides. And we've found that uh, detoxification enzymes are important in the resistant aphids and also that they've got mutations in certain sites within their nervous system where the insecticide molecules are supposed to bind. But because of those um, mutations, the insecticides can no longer attach and, and do their thing. So because of this resistance, I wanted to highlight insecticide resistance management for the soybean aphid. And it comes down to a few key points. First off, don't spray when it's not needed. So that means we need to get into our fields, scout them, estimating numbers of aphids and relating that to the threshold of 250 aphids per plant to decide when to apply that insecticide. Keep in mind that 250 aphids per plant is not the point at which we're incurring economic losses. This is a conservative threshold set well below the point where we would expect to see any kind of economic losses. If you spray, do it right. So be using the right nozzles, volumes, pressures. Um, we want to scout our fields again in three to five days after spraying, just to make sure that that insecticide did what we wanted it to do. And if you scout that field and find that there's another infestation of the soybean aphids there, we need to treat that field again. We want to alternate to a different insecticide group or mode of action. 
So shifting gears here, I want to talk a little bit about caterpillars. So this is a very heavily uh, defoliated um, soybean field, a picture that I got from Iowa State. It is not common usually to see levels of defoliation like this, but over the last several years, we have had parts of the state that have experienced pretty heavy infestations from a couple different caterpillar species. And in soybean, we know there are multiple different types of caterpillars, and, and it can be kind of tough to um, identify and distinguish these different these different types of caterpillars. I want to point out here one key thing to look at is what we call the prolegs on the caterpillars. Up here we've got the head of these three different types of caterpillars. Here we've got the thoracic legs. So these are the true legs and there's three pairs, right? You can see that on all three of these caterpillars. But then when you get back towards the tail end, you see these kind of false legs. We call them prolegs. And on this top one, there's one pair, two pair, and then a third pair at the tip of the abdomen. So these ones in the middle are the abdominal prolegs and the ones at the end are the anal prolegs. So for caterpillars, if you find them and they have a total of three pairs of prolegs, the, the abdominal prolegs and the anal prolegs combined, that would be the soybean looper or one of the other loopers in soybean. If you count four pairs total of prolegs, three abdominal, three pairs of abdominal prolegs and a pair of anal prolegs, that would give you the green clover worm. That's uh, really the only species in soybean that's going to have four total pairs of, of uh, prolegs. And then more commonly across the different species in soybean, you're going to see a total of five pairs of prolegs. And that could give you things like the thistle caterpillar, woolly bears, um, some of the web worms, cut worms, or army worms. So the, the kind of two key culprits that have been showing up more and more in soybean uh, over the recent years. One of them is the thistle caterpillar. And this is actually the caterpillar of a butterfly called the painted lady. Um, these are migratory, so they don't survive the winters here. Every spring they migrate northward from the southwestern US and Mexico. And there's some indication that these, uh, these migrations or the size of these migrations is associated with rainfall in Mexico and El Nino events. The butterflies, as you can see in the picture, are kind of pretty. They're orange, black, and white. The larvae are very spiny in appearance. They uh, web the leaves together, together, so you can see some of that webbing here, and they can be quite variable in color. Um, in Minnesota, we'll see two generations per year of the thistle caterpillar. The other species of caterpillar that I want to talk about is the green clover worm. So this is another migratory species. This one comes from south central, from the south central U.S. and will migrate northward each spring. Uh, the moths are triangular shape when their wings are folded. They've got kind of this pointed snout on the tip of their heads, and they're just kind of a drab brownish gray color. The larvae are green. Like I said on the earlier slide, they've got four total pairs of prolegs. Three, of, three pairs of abdominal prolegs and one pair of anal prolegs. And the interesting thing with this critter is if you touch it while it's on the leaf or if you pick one up and kind of tap on it with your finger while it's in your hand, they'll start wiggling around like crazy. And sometimes they'll even uh, wiggle so much they'll fall off the leaf or fall off your hand. And uh, this species is also likely to, to go through two generations per year in Minnesota. So these caterpillars have chewing mouth parts. They bite holes in the leaves. Um, so they're considered defoliators. And in Minnesota, typically any one given species defoliator isn't so abundant that, that we're thinking about managing that particular species. But sometimes we get multiple defoliating species showing up at the same time. And with their combined effects, we can get up to treatable levels. Um, so our recommendations are to consider defoliation from all the defoliators that might be out in your field. So that could be the caterpillars, beetles, grasshoppers. And we wanna estimate defoliation across the entire field. So that requires looking at plants from multiple locations spread throughout the field. And for each of those plants that you look at, you wanna estimate the defoliation on a leaf from the top, the middle, and the bottom of the plant. And then average those levels of defoliation from each of those locations on a given plant, 
and then across all those plants that you looked at in the field, and that'll give you a pretty solid estimate of the field-wide defoliation. You might want to find some kind of a pictorial guide to help you in uh, training your eye for estimating defoliation, because a lot of times when we see uh, soybean plants or really any other plants that are defoliated by an insect, we, we oftentimes overestimate how much defoliation is there. So we might look at a leaf and kind of freak out thinking, oh my gosh, that must be 75, 80% defoliation. But in reality, you know, maybe it's only 20 or 30%. So there's some apps that can help with this. Otherwise online, uh, University of Minnesota Extension, we've got a nice pictorial guide that shows um, pictures of leaves with different levels of defoliation. And we're estimating the percent defoliation for that soybean canopy and then relating that to the thresholds of 30% defoliation before the soybean is flowering. And that's the treatable level where you wanna line up the insecticide application. And then if your soybean is from flowering to pod fill, that threshold decreases to 20% defoliation. And I just wanna add, we wanna make sure that those pests are still in that field if we're gonna apply the insecticide. Sometimes you might get an insect in there um, chewing on the plants, causing that defoliation, but they might pupate and leave the field or, or some other event where they're not there. So if you get those threshold levels of defoliation, just do a quick check, maybe at the sweep net or poking around looking at some of the plants to make sure that the culprits are still there so that that insecticide application is worthwhile. Shifting gears again here, let's talk about a different arthropod. So not an insect this time, this is a mite. That's the two spotted spider mite. And we can see a picture of, of two mites in this picture here. Um, and, and we can actually see one of the eggs of the spider mites here. And these are called two spotted spider mites. And um, you can obviously see why they get that name with the, the two dark spots on the sides of their bodies. These are very small, slow moving organisms. In the picture on this slide, we see a baby soybean aphid, a soybean aphid nymph. And then next to that, we see a few two-spotted spider mites. And these spider mites are even smaller than this soybean aphid nymph. So these are very tiny. Um, like I mentioned, they've got the two spots, kind of greenish yellow to dull orange in color. And the symptoms is, are what you're most likely to see on the plants. The, the mites themselves are so small, you probably won't see them. So what we're gonna be seeing when we're scouting our field is probably the symptoms and the signs. So some of the symptoms are stippling of the leaves, these tiny little um, discolored spots on the leaves where the mites have been feeding. And as that infestation advances, we can actually get um, uh, the death of the leaves and, and loss of the leaves on the plants. And then a sign of their infestation is webbing that the uh, mites uh, leave on the leaves as they're walking around. So that's where they get the name spider mites because they're producing a webbing kind of like a spider silk that they um, leave across the leaves. So two-spotted spider mites, their outbreaks are typically associated with drought conditions, hot, dry weather for extended periods of time. And this is because these drought conditions cause uh, perennial vegetation surrounding the fields to dry down. Maybe the grassy ditches are drying down, the mites that were overwintering there are no longer able to feed on those plants. So they're gonna move in to the adjacent corn and soybean fields. The drought stressed soybean has been shown to be a, of higher quality as a food source for the mites. So that helps the mite um, reproduction and development. Higher temperatures are very favorable to spider mites. The mites do very well under um, the high drought like temperatures. And kind of the final component here is that these drought conditions work against or they suppress a fungal disease that helps keep the mite populations in check. So if we have drought conditions, it can suppress the fungus that is usually keeping the mites in control. And then the mites, if they don't have that fungus um, controlling their populations, their populations can increase much more rapidly. So spider mites are, are piercing sucking feeders, but they do so in a way that that's different from soybean aphids. Soybean aphids uh, tap into the plumbing of the plants, sucking the sap from the phloem. And you can see an aphid on the top of the leaf in this picture. Uh, 
down at the bottom of the leaf, you can see a, a picture of a mite and they're inserting their mouth parts into the leaves and actually destroying cells and sucking out the content. So they're not sap suckers, so to speak, like, um, like soybean aphids. They're destroying cells, sucking up the contents. And that's why mites can be so destructive is that as they're damaging those cells, they're causing irreversible damage or injury to that leaf tissue, which can result in, again, like I mentioned before, stippling, which are these small chlorotic spots, which can lead to loss of chlorophyll, um, decreased photosynthesis, leaf loss on the plants, and eventually under heavy infestations, we can get plant death. So when we're scouting for um, two-spotted spider mites, if we start seeing infestations on the field edges, which is where they typically occur first, we want to move into the interior of the field and walk some kind of a pattern, maybe a U-shape or an M-shape to make sure we're getting good coverage of that field. We want to check multiple plants from throughout that field and um, do so every four to five days when we've got uh, drought conditions because the, these, uh, the spider mites can increase their population so rapidly. So as we're looking at those plants, we want to keep this rating scale in mind. This is a, a spider mite infestation scale that Bruce Potter and Ken Ostley developed in the late 80s when we had uh, some very serious drought conditions across the state or across the, um, the region, really. And the key thing to focus on here is that a zero indicates no mites and no injury observed. And as you increase in ratings on this scale, the, the mite population is getting bigger and the, the injury to the plants is getting greater. So the key value is, is a rating of three, which is considered the spray threshold for two spotted spider mites. And that's when we've got heavy stippling on the lower leaves of the plants with some of that stippling progressing into the middle canopy. At that time, there's probably gonna be mites present in the middle canopy and um, maybe some scattered mite colonies in the upper leaves. And down at the bottom of the plant at this time, you might even have uh, some leaf yellowing and maybe some leaf loss. But the main thing at this point, that infestation hasn't really progressed heavily into the middle canopy and upper canopy. So if we're spraying at this time, the whole goal is to protect that, that upper canopy and, and parts of the middle canopy. So for chemical control for two spotted spider mites, which is um, the main tactic that most people are relying on, typically we wanna treat the whole field. Oftentimes, because when we see those infestations just on the edges, a lot of times we're gonna have mites spread throughout the field by then. If you're considering treating just the edges, make sure you inspect the interior of that field very thoroughly to make sure you don't already have mites there established and increasing. You wanna make sure you're getting very good coverage of the product that you're spraying. You wanna rescout that field, you know, maybe five days after application. And like I said, with the soybean aphids, if you have to treat that infestation again, make sure you alternate to a different uh, um, insecticide or miticide group or mode of action to help uh, prevent the development of an insecticide or miticide resistance. So some of the miticides or insecticides that we have available for management of two-spotted spider mites are um, chemicals like chlorpyrifos and dimethylate, which are in group 1B, uh, the pyrethroid bifenthrin. Um, and keep in mind that among the pyrethroids, bifenthrin is the only product that we want to be using for two-spotted spider mites because some of the other pyrethroids can actually make an infestation worse. They can flare those populations. Um, going back to group one with uh, chlorpyrifos, I just want to point out that um, Bruce Potter and Ian McRae documented um, a population of two-spotted spider mites in southwestern Minnesota that was resistant to that chemical. Um, we haven't documented any further resistance since then, but just to point out that um, there, there have been chlorpyrifos resistant spider mites detected in Minnesota. And then down at the bottom of this slide, we've got a couple of traditional miticides that are now labeled um, for spider mites in soybean, abamectin and etoxazole. So these are our products like Agarmac or Zeal. And just to point out here that the life stage is controlled by these miticides, abamectin and etoxazole are generally the eggs and the immatures, whereas the other products, the, the insecticides like the, the organophosphates and pyrethroids, uh, 
those are targeting the adults and the immatures of the spider mites. So the final insect that I want to talk about today, it's, it's a new pest. And up in this part of the state, um, you probably haven't seen it yet. And maybe, hopefully, it will be a while until you actually see infestations of, uh, of this insect, the soybean gall midge. Um, here's a picture of a stem that's infested with a larvae of this fly. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you see some, uh, some of the symptoms of infestation. So the soybean gall midge, it's, it's an insect that's new to science. It just received its scientific name um, a couple of years ago. So we're literally starting from scratch in our, in our understanding of this pest and in development of management tactics. So unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to provide you very um, thorough or clear management recommendations for this insect yet. Here's a map showing uh, counties that have known infestations of the soybean gall midge from Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri. Um, so five states, 114 counties that have had detections of soybean gall midge in Minnesota. We see that the infested counties are restricted mainly to southwestern Minnesota um, from Traverse, Traverse County in the north down to Rock County in the southwest and going as far east as uh, Faribault County. So soybean gall midge, they're, they're, uh, it's a fly, a kind of fly, a small fly, delicate bodies. Um, they've got a banding pattern on their legs. You can see kind of that light dark alternating pattern on the legs, um, kind of mottled colored wings, but it's very unlikely that you're gonna see these adults out in the field, whether you're looking at plants while you're counting aphids or you're doing sweep net sampling, don't expect to encounter the adults of soybean gall midge. If you encounter a field with an infestation of the soybean gall midge, what you're likely to see is going to be the larvae. So the larvae of the soybean gall midge are small. They're up to about uh, one eighth of an inch long when they're their largest. Uh, they're maggot-like, so they don't have any legs. You can't really tell the head end from the butt end. Um, as for coloration, the small larvae are going to be kind of clear to white colored. And then as they get older and as they grow, they are going to turn this, this bright orange coloration that you see in some of the larger larvae in this picture. We can see some smaller larvae here that have that, that whitish or clear um, coloration. So soybean gall midge, the larvae are infesting the stems of the soybean plants at the base of the plant and they occur under the, the epidermis of the plants. It's thought that the adults flies lay their eggs into cracks in the epidermis of the soybean plants. The larvae get in there, start developing, um, girdling those soybean stems. The infestations are probably occurring around the V2 or V3 growth stages. And this, a symptom that we'll see are these darkened lesions at the base of the plant. So the stems at the base get darkened, kind of deformed. And as the season progresses, we'll start seeing some of these symptoms where the plants will start wilting and dying due to the vascular tissues being severed and fed upon by the, um, the larvae feeding in there. And that um, feeding by the larvae within the stems can weaken the stems and cause the plants to break off. So you can get stem breakage and death under, under heavy infestations as, as those infestations progress. So like I said, this pest is so new, we still do not have very um, thorough management uh, strategies or tactics for this pest. Fortunately in Minnesota, where we have found infestations, most of those infestations are very light and probably um, don't require any kind of management. However, there are some fields, uh, especially down in Rock County that, that have been very heavily infested. Um, but what we can tell you right now is there's higher risk for infestation of soybean if it's planted near last year's soybean. Um, so a field that's gonna be planted to soybean in 2021 might have higher risk if it's adjacent to a field that was soybean in 2020. Uh, later planted soybean, in some cases, 
has shown less risk for infestation. We haven't yet found any varietal resistance to the soybean gall midge and insecticides like seed treatments and foliar treatments have not proven to be very highly effective from some of the research that's been performed. And then there are some challenges related to that, especially for the foliar treatments because these larvae are occurring within the plants. So they're not really exposed to the insecticides at all. Um, I want to point out another insect that has been confused quite often for the soybean gall midge. Here we see the adult of a white mold gall midge. And the larvae are down here. We can see that these larvae have a similar orange coloration as the soybean gall midge. But this insect, like its name implies, white mold gall midge is associated with white mold infected plants or, or sclerotinia infected plants. These are not pests, they're actually fungus feeders. So they're hanging out on soybean plants only because there's white mold there. So they could be on, on the surface of the plants feeding on the mycelia, or sometimes we even find them within the stems if those stems of the soybean or maybe even in the pods, if they're heavily infected with, uh, with white mold and have uh, uh, mycelia there. One thing to point out though is, is occasionally you might have a, a heavy infestation of white mold where you've got very prominent obvious mycelia, but if weather conditions shift and become less conducive to that fungus, it, it, those um, mycelia can be more difficult to see. So you might find these orange colored larvae on the plants and not necessarily notice that it was a white mold infected plant. Um, so just keep that in mind while you're scouting for the soybean gall midge. And the final thing here, I went, I went very quickly through the soybean gall midge and I, and I did so because we just recently conducted a, uh, a series of presentations online called the Midwest soybean gall midge series. That was back in January. And we recorded all of these. The first session was focused on identification and distribution of this pest. Where does it occur? How do we identify it? The second session was on the ecology and plant injury or impacts of soybean gall midge. And the third and final session was focused on management. So this um, was a very thorough session providing updates on these various aspects of soybean gall midge. The link is provided here. Um, as you have time before the next field season kicks off, I would encourage you to, to take a little time, um, watch these videos and get up to speed on this past. Again, we're not sure how widespread it's going to become in Minnesota and in and, and the region, but it's, uh, very likely that, you know, like other invasive species or new species, we're not certain if this is invasive, that, that it could potentially spread. So with that, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to present in this session. I'm providing my email address here if you have any questions. Mm -hmm.